ministry. Amen. 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 Welcome. And, uh, boy, I'm looking at Brother Dave sitting there, and he's another year older today. Amen. Yeah, I think we're going to spare them the happy birthday singing here. Keep everybody still in their seats. <laughs> you know, I really appreciate Dave and watching him grow. I was talking in the back here, one of the guys that really see the Lord doing something in his life and, and what that looks like, you know, what, what it, the change looks like uh, when... Somebody really allows the scriptures to, to get a hold of them and change them. And, and Brother Dave's that way. And, and as a result of God doing a work in his life, it's really been a journey that he's tried to spill into the lives of others. For many years, tried to spill into the lives of others. And so we find ourselves many times interacting. We, we play good cop, bad cop. We do all this kind of interacting together as we try to help people who are struggling through through addictions and different uh, life obstacles, but but we always come to the same point when we when we run into somebody who just isn't ready to allow Christ to have that spot in their life, and, and it's a terrible place to be because it's not doing a bunch of things. It, it's about a redirection of everything in your world. And, and so we know that and we recognize it. And so sometimes, you know, we've tried over the years to implement stuff in people's lives that they're not ready to receive. And anybody ever raising a teenager understands how that works. Not well, right? But the truth of it is when they're ready, when somebody's ready for a change, man, it happens. Because the two worlds come together. You know, the, the road to travel in the attitude of someone's heart that says, this is a good idea, right? And when those two worlds come together, something happens. And, you know, so looking at this character and our hearts go out, and we really, it's our desire, we really, it's like, we want freedom in Christ lived and bannered in, in his life in order that he experiences something he never has. And then also, that that will flow over into the lives of others as it's intended, as God intends it for every one of us, you know? And it really, it really perplexes my mind. And I realize that every one of us goes through this struggle. We're talking a little bit in the back about how we go in and out of, of faith, if you will, based on are we, go, we drift back to this automatic pilot, if you will, as we try to submit to the authority of God, his word, and his direction in our lives. And we have our own attitudes and opinions, and so sometimes we don't do what he says when he says it. And we drift in and out of this mindset that's dangerous for us. Because he has such plans to accomplish things in and through our lives and for us to experience these things. But we got to get on board with God. And that is an act of our will that's purposed in our heart. And you can't do it on the fly. You hear what I'm telling you? You got to do it beforehand. You got to make a choice. And as a result, your decisions will follow. The things you invest your life in, the things that you withhold from, the things that you find value in, all, all of that changes radically different when I've made a decision to submit my life to Christ, right? And it doesn't come easy. I've got a verse here to start us out, some verses, and it's, it's one that Emily says, it's the doo-doo verses, right? It's found in Romans chapter 7. I just want you to listen to the tone of this. I'm going to put a twist to it and challenge your thinking a little bit. It's the Apostle Paul, he said, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it. But it is the sin living in me, for I know that no good itself, uh, that good itself does not dwell in me, 
that it is in my sinful nature, that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do good, the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me, for in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man am I! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I my Self in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. That's chapter 7. We go into chapter 8 and we hear, for there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? I want to challenge you to think. I'll come down on the floor a little bit. The Apostle Paul came from a very decorated religious background uh, in following the law, the Old Testament law, and the picture of the lifestyle that he lived was a lot of mask wearing religiously. A lot of mask wearing religiously. So in other words, what's really going on in your head, you're going to keep that to yourself and you're going to portray a picture of being this righteous person when you know in your heart who you really are. Amen? So Paul knew that, but he was a guy that really tried to live by the law, the Old Testament law. When I say that, the Ten Commandments, you know, the, the, all the, the things that we need to focus on as that's a watermark to aim for, but it's not going to get you to heaven, right? And then the Pharisees would add all of these twists to the law, on top of the law, and on top of the law, of all these things that put heat the burdens on people's backs that they themselves were not doing, Right? So the Apostle Paul found the sinful nature that was alive in him in the beauty of the reality of the, our sinful nature is that Jesus died on a cross for our sins. And when we fail, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? But I want to tweak your thinking now. Perhaps maybe to think of it on another angle than typically we think of this passage. Many have said, boy, I relate with Paul. I relate with Paul. The things I don't want to do, those are the things I do. And the things I want to do for the Lord, I don't do those. What a wretched man am I. So, you know, praise God, there's no condemnation. You know, and we just keep going, uh, moving on in our life. And we settle for, I do the wrong things. But I think the Apostle Paul may have been talking about some things here deeper than we're seeing, and perhaps we do the same to some degree. Is Paul came from this religious background, and they had an outward, you know, adornment, if you will, that made them religious, uh, their profile before people honored, right? In any time we put a self-righteous attitude forth, We're on the wrong frequency. We're all but filthy rags before a holy God. And our righteousness comes from Christ alone. And so when we think we've arrived somewhere, maybe, just maybe, the Apostle Paul found himself thinking that he's arrived somewhere at times. Maybe considering... Boy, I really came a long way from that religious thinking to grasping the message of the cross and proclaiming it out of my mouth. And as a result, maybe in his heart he was thinking self-righteous. And he's thinking, you know what? I want to display Jesus and nothing else. In fact, he says that. I I want to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. So Paul had this journey going on that he was struggling through. And we hear it, we relate with it, and certainly we relate with it as the things I want to do, I don't do. And the very, how many of you are procrastinators? And so when you, Ron is laughing, looking at me, amen? We'll talk later. Anyhow, 
The truth is, procrastination is a problem, isn't it? And so you could be very well intended only to procrastinate, never to do what you intended to do. Am I right? Amen? All right. So then the flip side of that is, the things I don't want to do, there I find myself doing. There I find myself doing. Well, we can we can understand that one too, right? Um, anybody that's ever suffered of an addiction that's been on that carnival ride, they know what that is. Never going to do this again. I don't want this in my life ever again. Never, 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 never. Well, one beer won't hurt. And then, and then after one, then the second one comes in. And after about the third and a little bit of something else you shouldn't have, it's two days later. And you're right back in the same rut you were in. Amen? All right, so that's that scene. Let me take you to another one. You're on a journey, and you're serious about following Christ, right? You're serious about following Christ, and you've determined that you're going to put a framework of your life that is conducive for spiritual growth. You're going to implement some things in your life that are going to create a perimeter that continues your growth. And then we start to compromise that perimeter. We knock the fences down on our yard of decisions, amen? And we can wander outside them boundaries. And, you know, it's almost like doing this. Here's the fence right here, and I put my foot over, and I'm still all right until I'm not all right. Amen? Amen? So when you think about what is this, you know, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the very things I don't want to do, there I find myself doing. If I want to conquer that mess beyond chapter 8, where there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, I want to understand there's no condemnation for me because Christ paid the penalty of my sin, and I will say, hallelujah, praise God. However, I want to get somewhere beyond receiving God's grace and mercy and sitting in the mess that he rescued me out of. Because there's a purpose in order that he wants to show through your life if we get the message, what you're going to hear tonight. And I was considering in my earliest days as a believer, some of the people in my life and some of the things Rhonda was digging through Uh, some books and pulled out one that I have and uh, it it brought back some very serious spiritual memories. And so as a result of it, I thought about, you know what? This is how I teach right here. What I have, this is my style. Anybody that's ever been in my Bible studies, I'm always telling them, listen, my Bible studies are going to be life application. I'm going to tell you how this fits in your life and changes who you are to honor our God. Amen? Well, the reason I do that is because I came in to a relationship with Christ as a mess. I mean, just an absolute train wreck mess. And so the scriptures had to do something with me. In fact, I prayed as a brand new believer. I said, God, you know what? I'm like one of these little lambs. I heard in a Bible study we were compared to sheep. And, and, and the, the, the guy leading the study said, you know, was describing how stupid a sheep is, a lamb. And I prayed to the Lord. I said, man, I am just like that stupid lamb. I will mess this up beyond repair if I'm allowed to run free. So I surrender my will to you and I ask that you surround me with people that will make me walk in submission to your will. For a year about, I had that. I had people around me I thought I was in a bumper car. People were speaking into my life and they were right close to me and I was clinging to them as I knew the world around me was dangerous to my existence spiritually the way that it was with me in the condition I was, as in other words, surrendered to a new way of thinking that I didn't know what that meant. But I knew the one that does. Amen?
All right, so that's the essence of where we're going and what we're talking about tonight is from the picture of the Apostle Paul in his journey. We heard that. And we all know the struggles, the struggle is real. Amen? Amen. So you imagine Paul when he's trying to communicate. Now, when he's trying to, to pour his life, I talked about Brother Dave, you know, and I watch him share his heart and I see the distress in his face when he's trying to communicate something and somebody doesn't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. It's, it's repulsive to them. They're tolerating us because, for some reason. And most of the time, you know, it's repulsive to them and they run away. The Bible says the things of God are foolishness to those who are perishing. Right? But you want them to receive. You want them to receive. Think about Paul and him speaking. And what you have here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 and following, says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And he says this, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. That's a very humble position. Sounds like a man that's looking at his own heart and realizes what he is before the Almighty as he looks into the recesses of who we are. Amen? And as he's pouring out into this young man, he says this, and he says, but for that very reason I was shown mercy so that it, that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus, might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. God's using him so that they're going to look at this guy and they're going to say, man, that God in heaven has, man, his patience is unbelievable, right? And, he, and he's looking, he, he's allowed this guy to be this transformed person and he's offered us this eternal life. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. And I say to that, amen. You know, we're in a fight spiritually, if you're in a fight. God's not impressed with us just you know, being at a church or so on and so forth, just sitting in a service. He's not impressed with us just like pacifying the fact that we'll just sit here and listen. He wants to change us. He wants his love to to enter our lives and so, so captivate us that it flows out of us as a result. Amen? But we find this reality, you know, this is a fight we can win, this battle, you know, this crazy uh, thing that we find ourselves in. But getting close to the Bible or God or getting close to God's people doesn't change you. A submissive heart to him changes us. Amen? When he al- we allow the word of God to change us. So I have this passage, and I, and I really, for years, it's made a huge impact. But I, I got one part that was just pounding me in the head. Uh, And it's something that I've talked to many people about, but I had this revelation I was really considering. Uh, The the verse itself is is that uh, we we take captive every thought and we bring it to the obedience of Christ, right? We make it obedient to Christ. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6, but I want to consider some things. I want to consider some things for us in our lives that we can understand. And if we want to come out of this place tonight, we can take some steps that will make that happen. Come out of this place in a way that we start a journey with Christ that looks like a different road of life, that looks like a commitment, that looks like things that happen to us unexpectedly as a result of God doing what we never saw coming. We never saw it coming. And because of our journey of following him, 
He does something in and through our lives, and we do it corporately. We do a morning devotion every day, weekdays. And the whole concept is that we'll experience something together in each other's lives, right? And watch God do what only he can do, right? So this passage right here, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 6, is by the humility and the gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face, but bold toward you when away. Like, think about that, you know, timid when face to face and bold when I'm away. You know, so many people uh, are much, much bolder on a telephone or a text message than you would when you're standing face to face with somebody. Paul saying, you know what, when I'm face to face with you, I want to take it easy on you, but when I'm away, I'm going to lay down the facts and and that's what you're going to get. But listen to what he says, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. So he's, he's addressing a group of people, and if you can go back to our thinking of the things I want, the, that I want to do, I don't do, and the very things I don't want to do, there I find myself doing. And he's speaking to these Christians, and he's saying, I'm going to come and talk to some of you, and I'm hoping that this message you digest it a little bit before I get there because I'm going to have to take the volume up a step. Because you can't live by the standards of this world. Can't do it. Your spiritual journey, you're not going anywhere. Not only are you not going anywhere, you're a hindrance to those around you on a spiritual journey. You know what we call that? Deceiving ourselves. Right? Right? It's deceiving ourselves when we live by the standards of the world and we think we're all right with God. This is not the truth. He's got a a path for us to travel and he's going to guide it. Then he goes on to say this, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world, but but on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. This picture of weaponry, for though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. But on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. For years, as a new believer, I used to kick this verse. I'd memorize this from top to bottom. And, and I used to think about it all the time, about this demolishing strongholds and, and all of this stuff. And then, you know, as I'm older in my faith, I realized the message that's being communicated. I was looking at, this puppy that's in our house, little Molly. Molly is a Pomeranian Pomeranian husky mix. And it's got more energy than than a whole pound of puppies, right? And so every now and then it finds itself in a timeout in its little training cage. And I was watching the dog in there. Rarely does the dog sit down, the puppy sit down and relax and just chill in there. Most of the time, especially now that she's had some surgery. She's got that dumb cone on her head. And, and it, so it's, now she's got that one of those megaphones that she can bark through and, and shake, you know, probably I think the throne in, in heaven for God probably rattles when she barks. But she's in a cage. She's in a cage. And she's confined. And so I'm looking at that, and I was thinking about this passage of Scripture. And it's, it's got some very powerful truths about this. We take captive every thought and bring it to the obedience of Christ. So this captive thought, we're going to come back to that. Captive thought, it's not mauling in her cage, right? It's not a thought in our head confined to a space, right? We're going to come back. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Let's, incidentally, a stronghold can be when our own nature... Uh, you know, our own rationalizing, our own thinking, our own understanding is our navigation system. Instead of submitting to the authority of God, His Word, in the direction of His Holy Spirit. Are you with me? So when I allow my, you know, my thinking, my natural mind to put together a plan 
And instead of submitting to God, his word, and the directives of the Holy Spirit, a stronghold is developed. A stronghold. It's a place that holds me captive. And I can't get past it because I chose, I chose to be held by it. It goes on and says, The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and bring it to the obedience of Christ. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. So we have this stronghold, and the demolishing of the stronghold is going to be that my God in heaven, the word that he has spoken, the directives of the Holy Spirit, are going to keep me freed from the shackles of my own mind. Are you with me? I'm not going to allow myself to be a prisoner to what I think I'll never... How many of you would say you would relate to this? I'll never get past this. This will always be a problem in my life, right? And God says, no, no. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. So when I think about the knowledge of God, what God says, that settles it. I'm going to implement it in my life. And that's no matter what I think. So what I think doesn't get to weigh in here. It's not up for a vote. Amen? It's not up for, you know, a survey amongst my Christian friends. Are you hearing me? Because they might have an answer that might put a little bit more mortar on your stronghold. Amen? It says, and then we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Punish every act of disobedience. You know, when you know that you've made a mistake, you know that you thought something, you know the craziest part about the Holy Spirit of God is that he confronts us. The Holy Spirit's job is to lead us to all truth, and we know that. You hear me say that all the time. But when the scriptures are digested in our lives, you know what happens? The Holy Spirit confronts us with the truth of the word against the contrast of our thinking. Now you've got a choice to make. We've got a free will, folks. You hear what I'm telling you? And God gets the glory in our life when we pick to follow him despite what I think. Amen? You guys with me? And so, this passage of Scripture is very powerful. But we have to understand some things. We have to understand God wants to accomplish something in our lives based on our active participation on the journey So he wants to bring us to a place to take captive the thoughts and we're going to run them through. It's like, if you can imagine custom agents at a border and they're looking for smugglers, right? You know, I was watching one of those programs the other night about uh, border customs agents. They're always looking for narcotics. That's, you know what they're smuggling across? All sorts of foods that have all sorts of things in them that don't they shouldn't have. And they're, skid, they're getting that stuff in because they're, all their dog, they're not smelling out different kinds of honey. You hear what I'm telling you? They're looking for all the drugs because it's such a massive problem. But as they come across, they're looking for, right? And, you know, you understand. All right, so there's agents that are looking for that, and they're going to stop that from crossing through. When you're at a bank and you have bank people that are looking for counterfeit. They don't, they compare, they don't study counterfeit bills, they study the real McCoy. And when they see a counterfeit, it stands out. And of course, now they got those pens that just blow the whole thing right out of the water. But but the truth of it is, for us to understand, so when we take captive the thought, bringing it in obedience to Christ, it means I take it and I hold it up in customs, if you will, in my head. 
and then I allow the Word of God to navigate where this is going. And if it's sound thinking, it's going to be allowed to, to move forward. If it's not, it's discarded. It's gone. So it's not, it's captive. It's captive to be discarded, right? You might call your garbage can in the house something you, you take captive the garbage, but when the can gets full, what happens? It goes out to the garbage can outside, and then it ends up in a garbage truck to the landfill. And so when we have thinking that needs to end up in the landfill, we have to submit it to the authority of God's word, and we're the custom agent. You hear what I'm telling you? You're the custom agent. You're the one that has to say, listen, listen to what I'm, let me come on the floor with you for a minute. This has been plaguing my mind all week long because I've been there. Listen, now I know that there's custom agents, wink, wink, they're going to let some stuff go through, through. You hear what I'm telling you? You hear what I'm telling you? And then there's others, there's nothing going through. You see what I'm saying? You're the customs agent. You're the agent. And God says, how well is your training? Because if you're relying on your own thinking to navigate what's going through, you lose. But if you allow my word to direct your steps, you win. So when I tell you something, you know what it's always, we always watch these programs with custom agents. And there's always some guys or ladies that, we watched one of this lady was like super sharp. I mean, she could smell out narcotics out of in a baby's diaper. You hear what I'm telling you? This lady was unbelievable. She pops in, and somebody that's going to pass right through with another agent comes in and interrupts and throws a monkey wrench in their spokes. You hear what I'm telling you? So, now listen. So when we have... This mindset that says, I'm the custom agent. You'd say, you know what, Pastor, I'm not, I'm not that good of a custom agent. I'm not that good at smelling out these things that don't belong. Then I say, I'm going to bring the other agent that is. I'm going to make myself under the authority of somebody else. I'm not going to negligently let stuff slip through because I'm a doofus or I'm prideful or I don't want to change in my life and I'm just playing games, or I want to be friends with the ones that are going through the customs line. I want to be friends with them, so as a result, I'm wink, wink, slip through, and I'm doing them a favor, baloney. We make a difference in the lives of others when God makes a difference in our lives. Amen? So changes happen in our lives because we get confronted in the deepest part of our heart when we realize there's something that goes on with us, when you hear Paul say, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, there I find myself doing. That's every one of us. And when you come against it in, in a process like what we're talking about here tonight, that we're going to take captive these thoughts, we're bringing them to the custom agents. And if I'm not prepared, if I'm not seasoned enough on the journey, I'm going to bring somebody in with me. It's going to help me on the journey. Amen? I'm going to find victory because I'm going to intentionally allow God the freedom to do that in my life. Amen? I'm not going to play games with God. I'm going to allow Him to do what He does. And so I'm going to just throw some tools at you. Not, lip, not You don't have to put helmets on. But I'm going to give you some thinking that I think will be instrumental Remember, our natural thinking and the devil's input in our life equals a strong one. Let me just talk about that for a minute, the devil's input. You know, the scripture says that we're led astray by our own evil desires and then we're enticed, right? So we have our own evil desires and then the devil entices and a stronghold in our life would be something that appeals perhaps to me maybe elevates me to a position that, you know, I've put myself in or whatever. And 
And so I have thinking that doesn't align with the Word of God. And so I'm not listening to any friends or anything else. The devil whispers in my ear, I think you got this one. That's right. And when we, we, have, we process that information, that equals a stronghold. You're stopping your spiritual growth right there. Dead in the water. You hear what I'm telling you? So we want to grow. We need to have our minds change. And the way we do that is God wants to take this, reprogram it, to his thinking. Amen? So I got a Bible here. This is one. <clears throat> it's a serendipity Bible. It's for small groups or groups, you know. It's very interesting. This is not an infomercial for a serendipity Bible. But it's got in the middle here, has all these topics, so on and so forth, that are real life issues. That every believer from beginner to advanced hits in your life. From, from adolescent, pe- uh, young people all the way through, you know, singles, relationship, you know, married, couples, all these things, right? It's all in there. Serendipity is what it's called. Serendipity is what happens when two or three get together and share their lives and the Holy Spirit does something beautiful when least expected. You know, it's so amazing when you grow in your faith, when God does something that's unexpected, right? And you share that with others that are growing in their faith. Amen? That is an amazing thing. But you know, on my spiritual journey in my early years, I had groups of people that we had those kinds of studies that we would talk and people would say stuff that nobody wants to say in studies. At least in the ones that, you know, we try to, to provide life application. And when I say that, I say things that people come in my Bible studies and they go out the door. They do. They'll come in there and they're, they don't want no part of it. Well, why? Well, there's a couple things that happen. In our lives, we have to come to terms that we're not, we're not alone, that other people struggle with the same things we struggle with. Amen. You're not an alien as far as, you know, you're just some freak that has things going on in your world that nobody else has dealt with. No, there's nothing. You know what I was telling the guys back there? There was this pastor from years ago when I was real young in in my faith, and he was from Ravenswood in the city, you know, and he was a no-nonsense guy. He'd tell it to you straight up. He was an old-timer way back then. His name was Homer Wrestler, you know. And old Homer, he would tell you stuff. And he told me things, and he would tell me things straight up, right? And I said something, I think I might have hit a nerve with old Homer. I probably said something that sounded self-righteous. In other words, you ever get there where you feel like you're making progress in Christ, you think you've arrived somewhere? Yeah? Yeah? Or no? I'm, I'm the only one on the planet that suffered from that. Well, I said something that triggered it off, and he turned to me and said, there is not a sin, not a sin in this world that any one of us couldn't commit under the right circumstances. Look me dead in the eyes. And, you know, when he said it, I I didn't get it. I was real young in my faith. I didn't get it. All these years later, I'm just talking to these group of guys in the back over here, and I say, you want me to... Let me give you an example. You walk into a house and somebody is raping your wife and you have a firearm with you. You're going to be commit murder? I'm just going to leave that one lay there. But because the circumstances warrant something that we think demands immediate justice, that's not the way the law goes, is it? Am I right? So when the circumstances change, we get real. And we need the blood of Jesus to cover us. And we need to understand it's His His righteousness that we display. And when we understand how desperately we need Him, we, we begin to understand that the person sitting next to you struggles with the same things you do. Maybe not the exact same. But the same frailties that demand Christ's love 
in their life. And we want to learn, experience this together, and display it to this world, serendipity. Wonderful Bible that was gifted to me years and years ago. Do you want to mind the riches of God's Word? You, you know, this is full of, of riches. This right here is a tool right here that God gives us. And I'm not, not just necessarily serendipity, but the only thing about this that's nice is right in the middle of it, it has all these tools to use to take everything that's here and make life application by form of lessons in the life of a group of people. Sounds like a good idea to me. And so when you consider each one of us, do you want to mine the riches of God's word? In other words, do you, or do you think you're all right? Do you think coming into the church and just in, in being part of, of a service and, and maybe attending a Bible study here and there and those kinds of things that you're all right? Hosea 4, 6 says this, my people are destroyed for their lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priest. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I will also ignore your children. But that was heavy stuff. The part that just jumped off the page to me is my people are destroyed by lack of knowledge. Shouldn't be, should it? But when I think about having this experience, you know, where... God does something beautiful when you least expect it. Amen? You know what it does in people's faith? You know what the scripture says? They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. You know what that is? It's when you experience a, a, a inner, you know, it's like getting a B12 shot in your faith at the, in the life of someone else as you share it together, right? We grow together. You're part of it. You know, how do we grow together? How are you part of it? Well, you're praying for your brothers and sisters. And when you're celebrating, you're, you're, you're mining the scriptures, and God does something in your life, in their life, you're part of that experience. Amen? It's a wonderful thing. Are, are you in on it? You know, can you imagine God doing something? One of our soapbox verses is Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 says, Forgetting the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. When you didn't expect it, right? When I was a new believer, you know, there's a lot of, there's a handful of scriptures that are used, especially if you came off the streets and if, if narcotics were part of your world. There's a handful of scriptures that, that are used, and sometimes they're used in context or out of context. Uh, and there's uh, one I'm going to share with you. I just want you to consider um, of God doing something that we might realize and we might consider if we allow this reality to resonate in our hearts, right? You might consider you're not a victim. You're a victor, right? The Bible says we're more than conquerors, right? And God has a plan for your life, and you hear all these things. But this is a verse that back in the day with, with old Homer Wrestler, <laughs> way back, it's a verse that was common that I heard a lot, and, and I dwelt on it a lot. Speaking to the Jewish people, Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope, in a future, then you will call on me and come to me and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me, listen, with all of your heart. 14 says this, and I'll be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and the places where you, you have ban where, that have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Boy, I'll tell you what. Part of this verse that I think really resonated in over the years I've paid attention to is when it says, when he says this, 
Then you will call on me, and I will come and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. How many of you would say you need to be brought back from captivity? Amen? How many of you would say maybe you're not coming and calling to him legitimately? I'm not talking about the you know, a five-minute little prayer, you know, where you check it off your list of things to do in the day. I'm talking about when you're looking at your life and you say, I don't have any direction, I don't know what's going on, I don't know what this is all about, and I start to call to him. And I'm looking to the God who says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, right? Plans to prosper, not to harm. Plans to give you hope in a future. How many of you want hope in a future? How many of you would say it's time that maybe we start to seek him and he'll be found to us, but we have to seek him with all our heart? How many would say you need to be led back from captivity? Listen, you know when I think of where we started out with the Apostle Paul, things I want to do I don't do and the things I don't want to do, there I find myself doing. There's times Paul needed to be led back from his own captivity there, Amen. And there's times that we need to consider about what does it look like for me to call upon him, to pray to him, come to him, and seek him, listen, with all my heart. Because the problem that we have in, in the, the whole experience here on planet Earth, we make this our home, we have a covetous heart, we make this our home, and it's full of idols. God says, when you seek me with all your heart, I'll be found to you. And, yeah, amen? You know what, it's, it's funny because I've used an analogy from this over the years, and I keep coming back to stuff, and I'm just like, if I could scream and people could grasp the imagery, you know, when I use the analogy about you walk in on a horrific crime being committed against your spouse what action would come naturally to you if you had the ability and it would simply be murder in an instant our hearts identified that's the truth before the almighty God and so when we consider what it is that we would seek him with all our hearts I'm going to challenge you with another thought I use this analogy all the time I've said it a thousand times in all different groups of people and I said if I had a handful of one carat diamonds, ten of them, in my hand, and I threw them out, and we were over at, by the old building, and I'm like in that front little lawn area there, and I threw them out, and they just bounced all over the place, and it's raining, and there's a whole group of people that walked all over and pushed them below the surface. You can't see a single one of them. How many are you going home with if I say you can have every one of them? You just got to get them. If Drew's doing the mining, there's no lawn left, I'm telling you right now. Am I right? And I'm not just picking on Drew. I'm just, I know I could say this and he's going to be honest. But the truth is, before God in heaven, we would spend whatever plans you have, you would cancel them. Whatever else you had going on, it's off the table. This is what we're doing today. All 10 carat, all one carat diamonds, all 10 of them are going to be in my pocket. Not even, they're going to be wrapped up because I don't want to scratch them. Am I right? Because you're going to seek them with great value, and it's nothing but a monetary piece of stone. And the maker of all things, the creator of the universe, says, you want to seek me. You're on planet Earth. This is not your home. You have a covetous heart. You've got to come to terms with the fact that things that you want to do, you don't do. You procrastinate. In the things that you don't want to do, you're right in the middle of. And there's a divided heart that's here. And, and he says, listen, I know the plans I have. You have I, I, plans to prosper, you know, plans for hope in the future. But you've got to come to terms with this. Your seeking has to be undivided. 
Go to work on that one in your heart. Go to work on that one in your heart. You know where that comes from? It comes from a place where we come to terms with who we really are before the Almighty who sent his son to pay for our redemption because we're but a filthy rag before him. So when I say I'm seeking him, it's when I come to the realization that there's nothing I can do to please nothing outside of exercising faith. It's the only without faith it's impossible to please God. The only way I can please him is through faith, and it took faith to believe in Christ in the first place. So this journey, if I want to get somewhere on this journey, if I want to make headway, I have to say, you know what? I have a problem myself. I have a thinking problem. The mind that God gave me is to be submitted to his authority in order that it can reach potential that he's called it to reach. But because of my heart that thinks that I'm all that in a box of cookies mentally, I set him aside and I take up my own thinking. Can't do it. You hear what I'm saying? We can't do it part-time. We can't drift. I was, I was joking with the guys. I said, you know, we've been used a lot of plow trucks on this parking lot over the years. I had this old Dodge. And, and when I plowed, I had to use my left foot on the gas, and my right foot had to push the transfer case into four-wheel drive and keep my foot buried into it the entire time I plowed or it'd come out of four-wheel drive. And my thought was, hey, it works good when my foot's wedged in there. I'm driving with my left foot, Right? Well, the truth of it is, you know, it's broke. <laughs> Truck was broke. Had issues, right? And when we consider, you know, our spiritual journey with God, and we consider, you know, we've got issues. Amen? We've got issues. And God knows it. And he says this to us. He says, listen, I love you with those issues. I love you with the issues, but perhaps I'm going to give you something better than your foot holding the thing in four-wheel drive. You know, that's your own understanding. I want to do something bigger with you. I want to do something with you that you get the picture, that you cling to the leg of the Almighty for direction. Because you know there's no other place you want to be. When you're seeking him, it's with all your heart. Because you know there's no other way I can obtain the serendipity with a group of people, the body of Christ. I can't enter into this wow, this revelation together outside of me clinging to him, seeking him with all my heart, undivided. I recognize this is not my home. My covetous heart, I'm going to call out to him and say, God, I keep chasing after these things, and I want to put them in the slot that belongs to you. I don't want to do that anymore. So it starts with a confession. We say, God, that is, that's me that's being spoken of. That's me. At my best day, that's me. And you made provisions with Jesus on that cross. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but God Almighty, I want to seek you with all my heart. I want to seek you with all my heart that I would be, that you would be found by me. And God, I want you to lead me out of the captivity of my own thinking. I want you to lead me to a place of stability so I can reach the things that you've called me to reach. And as Paul said, that You know, you've redeemed us in order that this lost world, that they would receive, that they would see your incomprehensible patience as you work through our lives in order that they would receive eternal life. We want to be, we want to be used that way, Lord. Would you help us? Well, I don't know where you're at this evening. I always give an invitation. I always do because I think Especially tonight when you consider, I, get, I just talked about a tool that was used in my life, a serendipity Bible, simple. It's a very simple. You can go online, you, you know one just like it. You'll be a small group leader next week, right? But I would suggest you start to read through it. You know what's going to happen in your life? You're going to be equipped with the Word. God's going to confront areas of your life, and you're going to see 
It's just like, you know, you ever looking for something you've been looking all over for and you're shining a flashlight a along and you're looking for something and you shine your flashlight and you see something else that's much more valuable? Are you hearing me? That's what God does. We get on this pursuit of Him. In the process, we're looking for something else. We might want a pro uh, an answer to a little problem that we have. And when we start shining His light around, all of a sudden we have this serendipity moment with the people around us. And I got something much more valuable than my little problem solved. I've got a new experience in Christ that my faith blossoms and grows, and so does those around me. He does something amazing. Amen? Well, like I say, we always give an invitation, so that's your cue, guys. Whoever's going to go up there and make a little noise. Tim, whatever. I think it's you. I think it's Tim. But, yeah. So you can make a choice. You could say, you know what, God? I want to make a choice, and this is it. I want to have a structured plan to grow in your word. And I want to do it. I want to put myself in a position to be under the authority maybe of, this, maybe of the other custom agent that's going to walk and say, let me take another look at that for you. I'm going to put myself in that position to say, I want to end up where you want me to be, God. Would you help me not to wink, wink at stuff in my life or in somebody else's that's so damning for them? I want to be who you've called me to be. Amen? But wherever you're at, wherever you find yourself, why don't we just respond to God tonight? Amen? I'm up here, and I'm just going to call Rhonda up tonight. I'll let Brother Dave and Joy sit right there. Drew, you can come on up. But if the Lord's speaking to you, how about you respond? Amen? As this music plays... Father, I pray that you would just work in our hearts, not only for who's here, but those who are watching online. God, if there be something in our way, God, that you want to reveal, you want us to lay down in order, God, that we would find ourselves living in the environment you've called us to live in as you guide our steps. Have your way, God. Would you come as the music plays?